Hi, ladies and gentlemen, witches and wizards, all fans of all ages. Thank you for joining us today on Nom Witch Review, a division of Nom Talk Network, where we actually discuss, review the latest film drop or a throwback celebrating a milestone while eating and drinking our favorite movie, snacks and drinks. Today, I'm your host, Alejandro Cowie, and I am joined by two others here, Alex and Ethan, which I will introduce shortly. Um, just to let you know, before I skip my own portion of the show here, I am nomming on some fried rice and some General Chow's chicken. So I'm super excited about that. A little shameless plug of Coca-Cola. So I want to actually shift the attention back to both Alex and Ethan. Please say hello, guys, and tell us what you're nomming with us today. Hi. Hi. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, you I'm go. Gonna, well, since Harrison Ford really loves noodles in this movie, I uh, brought some chow mein and uh, got the Coca-Cola as well. So Heck yeah. I unfortunately don't drink soda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, we brought some Reese's and it's just kind of a play on our last nom review. Um, which, which uh, E.T., e. which, e. e. which, yeah, which just... obliterated this movie at the box office in E.T. <laughs> oh, it did? Yes, it did. Oh. Oh my gosh, how crazy. That's a big connection. <laughs> but yeah. Awesome. Excellent. Excellent. And thank you for actually making up for my mistake. We are talking about Blade Runner uh, 1982. So thank you for actually making up for that. Um, so I'm super excited to be here with you guys. Thank you for joining us. Um, now, first of all, when we actually go ahead and speak about this film here, um, I, I have to say, like, I want to actually go ahead and take it uh, to Ethan first. Um, how are you introduced to this film, my friend? Uh, what age do you remember? Or if so, uh, do you remember like the timeline you were introduced to this epic tale? Um, I had known about this movie when I was a really little kid. And then I think it was like the summer before seventh grade. I went to the library and I saw the director's cut um, was just on a VHS in there. And, um, yeah, yeah, I watched it and... I think it was later that year they came out with Blade Runner the Final Cut, which um, yeah. I got the DVD and it had it had all the cuts on it. I think it had like four different cuts. It had the theatrical version, it had the international version, which has a bunch of deleted stuff and violence that you can't see anywhere else, and then the director's cut and of course the final cut, which we you know, which is the most widely known version now. So yeah, yeah, I've been a fan of it since like 2007. So heck yeah, man. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think I actually got it in my notes here because I got some notes here. Um, there's like actually seven versions of it yes. out right now just due to the studio and executives not being able to like request and not the ability of not being able to make up their mind. So that, that's just that's just crazy. Um, mm -hmm. Alex, uh, when, when you introduced the film, uh, I, this film, about what age do you remember? Um, recently, probably, well, okay, probably Ethan's memory is way better than mine, but it was, he introduced me to the film. I never uh -huh. watched uh, sci-fi. Um, in general, my parents never, like, my parents, I think, are, I don't want to say, like, against sci-fi, but they're one of those people where if something like Blade Runner c came Star out, War Let's just or say Star Wars, Wars. <laughs> like, anything uh, sci-fi, it was nerdy. just something, they were just literally kind of repulsed by it a little bit. <laughs> never, I mean, never, my dad definitely is like, oh, that's kind of weird. That's weird. <laughs> that's just the phrase. It's weird. Um, but I, I remember, like, you know, he's always been someone, um, Ethan's always been someone to introduce me to new films. And I don't know if it was during COVID or if it was before COVID. It, um, was, it was around our first year of dating. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was, like, the first sci-fi movie that I've ever like really just like divulged like, into like really hard sci-fi yeah really hard sci-fi and um i can't remember what my first like reaction was to it but i mean i like harrison ford and so i felt like um it's just one of those things for for me watching like a sci-fi movie uh, as an adult it's just a, for me it was like a lot to process of like how uh, a director can be able to just um make a whole world with all of its um world building so I just really took me a while the process to understand beyond than just this earth and um mm -hmm. also just going into visually how all the actors look I feel like they're very just um I don't know like very future very uh, aesthetic very aesthetic yeah <laughs> so you know I feel like yeah, I was it was fairly recently so let's just say probably like two two or three years ago and yeah I mean I really liked it but have to be honest um it took me a while to still comprehending um everything about it but just watched it for the third time today and so um i just realized more and more each time 
Heck yeah. That's awesome. Um, you know, on that same point, we talked about uh, something for you guys. We're going to reflect the question back at you, but I want to join the chat real quick here. Uh, we do actually have Q in the house, evening all. He says he remembers that movie. Um, and then we also have Eva with us today. Hello, Eva. How's it going? She says, hello, everyone. Hello. Now, on that note, you know, thinking about the movie itself, uh, you know, going to the popcorn buckets, I see you guys rated it pretty decent high. Myself, I have that awkward but familiar three out of five popcorn buckets. Now, the reason for me is I kind of got slapped with the intro of the film um, kind of uh, right there. I had no idea what was going on. I didn't I wasn't hinted to who was acting in it uh, or the ability. It was just visually stunning. And then I was confused. Um, now, that's initially why the rating is low. However, um, the visuals were just gorgeous. I mean, it was hard not to sit there and try to lift your jaw or sit there like, oh crap, I'm going to wipe the saliva that I'm you know, drooling over here. Do you see the models, that are foreign models that are on screens of the advertisements of the billboards going slowly through the sky? Um, you have this kind of looks like the Neo New York, Neo Tokyo style. Speaking of Nam Tot Network and food, and, and you know, shout out to Ethan because you continue to eat those noodles there, my friend. Um, you know, the noodle trucks that they stay or the food trucks that are out there. I still have that essence a little bit of also, if you, if you remember, we touched base a little bit in a previous show on uh, the fifth element as well with their little food trucks and the futuristic you know neon concepts of them so it was fantastic um ethan i'm going to hop a question to you though my friend here uh yeah. if i'm correct this film was based on a book called do androids dream of electric sheep right yes that's correct yeah <laughs> i've never i've never read it um i've okay, never read okay. it Hey, Dick, but I am familiar with all the movies uh, that come after, um, like Total Recall. I'm a huge fan of uh, Minority Report is awesome. Um, I'm trying to think. I even like uh, the John Woo Ben Affleck movie Paycheck. That's I think yeah. that's a Dick. That's right. Exactly. And also, uh, I believe a Scanner Darkly in 2006, uh, 2006 yeah, right? Yeah, that's that one too. Yeah. Yes. So, um, yeah, I, I don't. I honestly don't know much about Philip K. Dick other than um, he likes to the, the movies, the movies that I've seen, you know, based on his stuff. Uh, it all it all has to do with the uh, really reality bending stuff. And I mean, that's For that's sure. what that's what pure cinema is all about, you know. And that's cool. I mean, you know, and, and to, you know, capitalize on the point that you're making, um, it's almost like, a, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, it goes back to the classic hero's tale. You know, you have these things that are called replicants. And in the best way I can say replicant, it's almost like a clone, right? Uh, and this, these clones have the circulatory systems and the basic concepts of, uh, are you guys familiar with uh, Westworld? Um, no. I, I saw the original movie, never mm -hmm. seen the series. But gotcha. Still, okay. So I get the concept. So, yeah. So it's a similar concept to developing a human like species form and body, you know, from actual recycled material that they have. Uh, and, and like, and the thing about it of a replicants, they're amazing, but the classic case scenario replicants starting to feel. You know, getting that, you know, uh, that taste of reality, um, that desire that's a little bit more beyond that nine to five in a replicant or clone life that they're yeah. led to live. Um, or in some cases, you know, body bags and, you know, that's neither here or there. Um, but the fact that they take replicants and technically they're supposed to be villains, technically speaking, yes. right? I never look at replicants as bad guys throughout nope. the whole film. I can't, I, I, I try to. And without spoiling a little early with the classic Harrison Ford and main bad guy exchange that they have at the end, we'll all let you guys touch base on that. I, I just, there's not one part in there where I think that they respond that's not deserved. Like yeah. if they were attacked or what the questions were, I would respond the very much the same way because I want to live. You know, I don't want to die at all. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I'm going to hop this to you, Alex. Um, in regards to the storyline and development, would you agree with me here? Is there anything that stood out to you the most? Yeah. Um, so actually, um, we were talking about this right before um, we started the show. And um, there was a, a, I can't remember the exact words I used, but I feel like uh, exactly what you're saying uh, within the right circumstances. So you're saying like, well, or maybe um, how I'm interpreting it is um, replicants have like a baseline of, you know, they're supposed to just do what they're told and they're supposed to fit into this box. And I feel like for me, it relates to being a human and you think like, you know, at the core of every human, you're supposed to just do the right thing. 
Um, but when you're put in the certain circumstances, uh, like the replicants are being a human, you know, some certain times, like, you know, a different, like I, I called it like a monster can come out, but it's due to responses of what's going on around you. So, um, yeah, I really feel like I enjoyed the plot a lot and basically understanding, you know, the perspective of replicants and, um, what's the fine line between like, uh, like a, well, I'm not going to say, yeah, there's a part in the movie where basically uh, Rory says, like, um, he says something like heaven or hell. It's yeah, like some yeah, kind uh, of a five, six, Yeah, he's like, he's like counting down. He says five, six, seven, go to hell, go to heaven. Yeah. yeah. And I felt like that was a really interesting uh, quote to me because you kind of, you know, don't know the fine line of like what it means to be a good person or what it means to be a bad person. Because, like, if you're put in certain circumstances to make you, you know, like, I guess in society think it's bad, but your intentions were good. Like, there, I feel like to me, it's kind of a self discovery of, of, uh, of, um, I don't know, how do you say it? Like, uh, in your own self discovery of, mm -hmm. like, you know, who you are and what your values are, what you stand for. So it's not really about the reactions, it's about the intentions. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I really enjoyed the plot. So, I feel like I do agree with you. <laughs> I can't and, imagine. Uh, Excellent. Yeah to, kind ahead, of yeah, to kind of piggyback off that, um, yeah, something that something that didn't strike me until, you know, seeing it many, many, many times is that, yeah, like you said, you know, like the replicants are the, the sympathetic characters here. Harrison Ford is a prick in this movie. Um, mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a terrible person, you know? And I think I think what Ridley Scott is trying to get at and what he started, he started the seeds of in his previous film, Alien, and it would return in Prometheus and Alien Covenant is that, you know, in the future, humanity is going to discover things that's going to basically it's going to basically dilute what makes us human uh, through technology you know and yeah like uh throughout this movie harrison ford i guess it depends on which cut you're watching but um the original cut uh there's no ambiguity there harrison ford is in fact a human um hunting down hunting down replicants whereas in the director's cut and in the final cut um they introduce the idea that he may be a replicant and um He's sort of, he's sort of trying to discover what it means to be human throughout the whole movie, and uh, there's that scene where he uh, guns down Zora, um, uh, the, one of the replicants, uh, the one that works Goes in that the club. Shatter, the shattering. Yeah, through the shattered yeah. glass and everything, and like From the shopping mall, right? Yeah, huh? what's that? At the shopping mart area, right? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly, exactly. And um, it's it's a spectacular moment, you know. You see her crashing through the glass, just just trying, just trying to survive. And he guns her down so coldly. And then uh, moments later, like you see him visibly shaken. Like he 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 rushes to go buy a bottle of booze, and he just can't control himself. And uh, yeah, yeah, basically that's uh, yeah, that, right. uh, yeah. <laughs> that was nuts too, because the uh, the scene you were talking about, right? The lighting with the just neon signs. And, you know, the POS systems that they had there, it all looked like a legitimate farmer's market in, like, neo-New York right there and then. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that replicant's acting ability, you can see the pain in their eyes, but they're getting shot and everything. And just that brief three seconds, because, I mean, let's be real, late 80s, early 90s, um, when it came to action, it was pew, pew, shoot, shoot, and some yeah. dramatic blood, and that was it, right? So when we actually got to see something like that or see – somebody experience a pain and therefore shortly afterwards you hit it the nail on the head you see him shook the fact that i i killed somebody and that somebody responded like a human being would <clears throat> so that that ability there was insane um as you were speaking earlier alex uh mentioning the fact that we were talking about and ethan you actually originally brought this up uh how replicants start to feel um Going into the chat here, Evan mentioned said that she said, I give this a three, two as well. I feel the same way. And she goes, does anyone know or remember the movie Equilibrium? Now, um, oh, and also Q-Ball mentioned too, if you think, remember Demolition Man, that movie almost had the same vibe as Blade Runner. Now, Thanks. Equilibrium, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, uh, with Christian Bale. Um, I, and for our fans out there, it's a fantastic film. Uh, came out in the late 90s, early 2000s, around the same time the movie The Matrix did. Uh, the reason why it didn't actually get as much of an American standing ovation is because at the time The Matrix being the release, it almost looked just like the same style of movie. Yeah. 
So what ended up happening is they took this movie, went overseas to Japan, and it actually made an additional $30 million and made up the fact that it lost box office money in the first release in North America. That being said, the only reason I bring this movie up is that Christian Bale plays this character called a Graviton Cleric. And in this world, uh, World War III has already happened, and the nation of every nation in existence doesn't want anyone to fuck up ever again. So they determined determine that the cause of all war is the emotion in general of feeling. So I have a drug called equilibrium and everybody takes this drug to not cease any emotion. However, if there's any hints of resistance or emotion pops up, they send these Graviton Cleric guys out there. They're like Terminator guys that do this Kung Fu gung, you know, shooting magic kind of concept. And what ends up happening is they don't, they also take the drug too. Christian Bale forgets to take his and he starts to slowly feel. Holy crap, gets intense. <laughs> really good. Full of action, dude. It's so awesome. Oh my lord. Um, oh, yeah, excellent. We got some great reviews over here from the, uh, the chat here. Uh, producer Steph reached out and said, Hey, should we review Equilibrium? And we got some great responses. So we'll see if we can go ahead and review that in the future. That'd be great. Um, I digress. Uh, I'm going to go on to the next question here, if you don't mind. I'm going to shoot it towards your way, Ethan. Sure. Now, um, to talk about this here, um, I think you would hit the nail on the head if I asked you this question. Ridley Scott and his style of directing. Um, I have to ask you, well, sure. <laughs> can you explain and uh, explain the process? And do you agree with his process directing of this film? Uh, so Ridley Scott, um, yeah, he came up, he came up from the seventies, eighties, uh, and I guess you would call it the MTV era, you know, um, very, very stylish, very heavy, slick visuals, um, very, very synth heavy scores. Um, and yeah, his previous film was Alien. And I think, I think what he was really trying to do in at least the first part of his career, um, before he really tried to get respectable, um he just he just tried to create these very vivid worlds and just try to evoke a mood you know um and i think here see this is this isn't a movie i really watch for for the plot you know it's it's something that i just kind of want to i just kind of want to breathe in and you know the the thematics it's all there um and i think the cool thing is is, is that really scott he doesn't he doesn't try to too heavily nail things on the head um maybe he gets there a little bit towards the end with the the grandiose speech that roy gives um but uh actually, can you actually in that interaction can you explain that interaction a little bit more what what really stands out there the most for you in that interaction between him um, and harrison ford so, yeah so about that yeah because Her harrison ford yeah he just he just killed pris uh spoiler alert he just killed pris who was who, who was roy's lady basically yeah. And uh, so Roy in this final, ba basically, because he knows it's the end. He just met with his creator. His creator said, no, it's I can't really, can't really extend your time, guy. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, he, uh, he sort of reverts to a, like, a, like a wolf form. Yeah, he starts howling. And then, yeah, they go on this big chase throughout the, the Bradbury building in, in L.A. Um, oh, that then, was yeah. that. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's where it's at. Yeah, the Bradbury building. Um, and then, so when, yeah, once he has Harrison Ford at his mercy, he's, uh, Harrison Ford's terrified. This is it. You know, he's about to die. And then uh, Roy, just out of nowhere, you know, this is the bad guy. He saves him. And what's going on there is, is that, you know, Roy, Roy really wanted more time and he couldn't get it. He rebelled. He rebelled against the system, against humanity, and in his final moment, I think I th I think personally, he just wanted to, uh, he just wanted to do something beautiful, and I mean, what's more beautiful than saving a life? Even even if this person was gonna take your life, he took the life of your friends. Um, f forgiveness, you know, that's the ultimate. That's the most human thing, yeah. most human emotion we can come up with. You know, and uh, with that, Harrison Ford, like he's really just touched. Um, and yeah, that's that's what really it really it really everything clicks into gear right there. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, yeah, I think I oh, think yeah. I. 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. No, you did a fantastic job, man. There's no judgment here. I was just taking it. In. I was like, I'm going to keep talking. I'm going to get my Panda Express and my Blade Runner knowledge. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. No, I, I totally agree. That That's the um, only reason why I didn't rate the film a zero out of five was that speech there. As clueless as I was, as clueless, quote unquote, at that moment, because you do have Harrison Ford shot up, broken. I'm like just, just in the corner about just death, done. Yeah. And he's hanging at this point, right? Um, oh, also going to reach a chat here, Q in the house with, I would rate this movie a five out of five because of the action, the visuals, the vibrant colors, and the sort of mix of American and Japanese style of filmmaking combined. Hell yeah. Excellent Which, point, Q. Go ahead, buddy. Go ahead. To go back to Ridley Scott a little bit. Um, yeah, uh, later uh, later in the eighties, he made a movie called Black Rain. And um, if, if you're interested, if you're interested in uh, this style, um, actually going to Japan, yeah, I would recommend checking out Black Rain. Uh, that's a that's a really cool neo noir flick. But um, yeah, uh, I as far as Ridley Scott goes, yeah, I'm a huge fan. Um, I think I think visuals, yeah, pretty second to none. Um, pretty unimpeachable as far as visual stylists go. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 like video games today, you know, mm -hmm. with like PCs and <clears throat> you know, of course, classic PlayStation and Xbox. It seems like that style of cyberpunk ish is all represented and foundation from Blade Runner. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's hard not to see it, you know. Um, and then given the fact that it once again it did influence the films we were talking about before like total recall minority report uh scanner darkly um the crazy thing about it though um it, it also had a trio release i guess the latest was in 2017 uh when it came out with the blade runner 2049 the blade runner 1982 and a third one called blade runner black lotus which is an animation that i'm hearing um so i haven't seen it yet on that regard um but uh, interesting enough, though, uh, they were talking about the budget, you know, the budget of the film being around 30 million and the original box office uh, profit about 41.6. Yeah. Um, they said the latest one wasn't as hot, but it had almost the same release, um, you know, with its foundation of its budget. I have to look up a little later. Um, its uh, profit was almost equivalent. So it kind of X'd out in a sense. So that's why they kind of went for the, the triple release there um, for uh, in 2017. Now, uh, Alex, I want to uh, shoot a question your way because I know you had some interesting facts that you said you had on, on this here. Um, would you like to touch base with any of them by any chance that we might not have went over, even ones that we went over? I'm totally cool with that. Yeah. Um, so as I was watching it, um, I think the specific part we were just talking about where the girl like shatters through the glass, I really liked her um, her like see-through jacket. Oh, yeah, coat. yeah. <laughs> and then in the new, uh, the Blade Runner 2049, um, I forget what the main, uh, the girl, the, uh, his, yeah. his, uh, rep, not replicant, but his uh, holographic, oh, um, uh, Joy. girlfriend, Anna Joy. Anna yeah, yeah, her, she has a yellow one at a certain point. Oh, so I really cool. thought oh, the costuming is just amazing. So I just started researching the costuming a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it said, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I, I might be butchering last name, but, um, I my Kaplan and Charles uh, Node. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just like researching their background and like costuming because like, you know, of course, the the visuals of all the neon lights that, you know, Ridley Scott provides are, is awesome. But I was thinking about how it reflects off of all the costuming as well. It's just amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just was noticing. So for like Michael Kaplan, it says that um, he also did the, um, the costuming design for Armageddon and uh, all the new Star Wars uh, movies. Uh, like the, the, the most sequels. recent mm -hmm. the most recent ones and then war dogs pearl harbor miami vice and then one of the mission impossible movies shit yeah and i thought that was so awesome and then um <laughs> the the charles node and um, he says he won a, a bafta award in a 1996 for braveheart so i just thought that was amazing i saw braveheart growing up with my dad and so i always thought the the costuming was always amazing on that one and then Legend as well, which is also yeah, uh, which Ridley is really Scott. Scott's follow up to this. Yeah, so he worked with him again, and also mm -hmm. won a BAFTA award, and then you know also did the Odyssey, and then uh, Blade Runner run for um, a BAFTA award as well for the costuming for this one. It's uh, for uh, yeah the same the same thing, but I just thought that was amazing going into just um, all the excessive fur coats and just like you know playing with all the silhouettes that they had. 
And then, um, you know, even just uh, like being in the marketplace, how like there was a police officer that I saw had like a um, some like sun goggles on or like just goggles on. There was like a light, you know, and I see so many um, movies nowadays, you know, for instance, like uh, like Top Gun, the new Top Gun. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, when someone's wearing like a helmet for like visual purposes, they put like a light inside of like the helmet to, so you can see their face. So it's because typically if you know, someone's on a motorcycle or an astronaut, um, they're wearing, um, you can't see their face, but for like visual purposes, not, not an astronaut for Top Gun, but he wears like a suit, like going into that, uh, I don't know, he's going like 10 G's or something Uh, like that. But I just thought it was interesting because in the film uh, for Blade Runner, like, you know, even though the movie is dark in some aspects, like in the contrast to the neon light and then the slick dark background, but I feel like, um, with the people who are all walking around the street like you know there's there's things visually on them that like that are lit that are light yeah that light up so um yeah i just thought that was really interesting to look into the awards that those uh those designers have gotten and all their credibility to get to this point working with with ridley scott and continuing to work with him afterward that's fascinating you should say that because i'm looking at the bottom here i'm sorry to interrupt you ethan i'll go right back to you my friend um i'm I'm looking at the bottom here as you were mentioning the whole thing in regards to you know really scott's you know coming into the project uh you know getting that much you know credentials behind or how much credentials he actually had behind him and i was looking into here and it said that he actually turned down the first offer towards to actually direct this film right and not only did that happen but evidently uh, there was, let's see here, Michael Dealey, when he became interested in, I guess, the draft portion over here, he spoke to Ridley Scott about it again. And at this point, Ridley Scott was so fed up with the slow production of the production of Dune that he was just kind of like, I really don't want to do this anymore. anymore. So then when he spoke to um, Michael Dealey about this, Michael Dealey not only convinced Ridley Scott to come on the production, he also raised the original request of $13 million for the transcript to $15 million. So they cranked it up another $2 million and got Ridley Scott into this just at, like you said, just because of trustworthiness and previous productions of like Michael Dealey and Hampton, you know, venture on this. It's, it's, I just didn't know that. It's fascinating. And then I guess evidently Ridley Scott's brother also passed away. And it was, he said it was a moment of reflection on him and he, that he wanted to actually accomplish more than he had. So that's another reason why he pulled the trigger. I mean, the, you know, joining it, not the physical, that sounded really off. You did the point. That's <laughs> oh my Lord. Wow. <laughs> Wasn't a purposeful joke. Please audiences don't scam. I'm sorry here. Um, well, back to questions here or uh, the comments in the chat. Q-Ball says, Hey, Harrison Ford, in my opinion, is one of the best 80s action drama actors ever. Uh, Eva's like, I agree with you, Q. Uh, Q Ball says, yes, he's a big, uh, his big break was Star Wars, but every year he comes out with a kick, mo- uh, kick-ass movie and a new character to root for. Come on, uh, d- come on, from Han Solo to Indiana Jones, enough said. Q, you're so spot on that. Interestingly about that too, Harrison Ford evidently started his big kick into acting when he was actually 42 years old. Uh, evidently, he was a carpenter, uh, and that was a side job on sets. Not to say he hadn't did stuff in the past, but at the age of 42, he really broke out in there. So him and uh, I believe it was Morgan Freeman at the age of 54 really broke yeah. out into their strides too. So talking about a little motivational concepts. I got years. I got years. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> um let's see here uh now in regard i'm gonna shoot it back to you ethan um considering the fact that you're familiar with ridley scott's directing uh it seems that you're familiar also with harrison ford and some of the characters and the interactions between uh, harrison ford as his hunter self and the replicant itself uh i want to bring up the term philosophy um was there any moments i would say not only to the one that we just discussed or towards the beginning of the film was there any philosophy or i would say hints of of life lessons that has altered your current philosophy in life or anything that stuck out to you the most in the film in regards to philosophy sorry in regards to the philosophy well there's the there's of course the tears in the rain speech um like i said earlier yeah about how how as we as we you know get deeper into the 21st century you know i think we're we're sort of losing sight in what makes us human you know through technology you know um 
as far I can't really think of anything as far as you, 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 you mentioned but technology, buddy. And I don't mean to interrupt you on this portion here, but maybe help a little bit because we were talking about how Blade Runner also influenced some films. And you mentioned before uh, Minority Report, and I believe that came out in two thousand two, right? And, and we're, ter- we're we're talking about the term, um, you know, the term technology. I guess the thing that really pops into my head is how they actually use replicants in the movie Minority Report. Um, mm-hmm. Now I remember one thing you mentioning and i have to and if you can look this up for me it'd be fantastic but i heard replicants have timers and why why is that so a little bit if you can tell me if you if you can figure out why they have timers and and the usage of them because replicants in the movie minority report they live non-stop as long as you take care of them and they live in these echo chamber areas and they attach monitors and they predict futures of current people in society and whether they're about to predict murder or not and if they predict that person's about to do something that's equivalent to murder then that name pops out gives to people like good old tom cruise and he puts on his sci-fi police gear puts on his little little case thing that lights in the helmet and he finds them yeah and they try to try to do it before the end so to me it seemed to be a huge development in just the, the fact of you know who these replicants are as they really seem to be focused on technology um now if i'm correct in total recall replicants were actually not necessarily a separate entity but they were actually masked like material and genetic material made from replicants that they were allowed to put on people like uh arnold schwarzenegger when he looked like that lady at the right. electronic tsa thing right so uh, the you know cow. yeah yeah <laughs> exactly exactly so you know it, it's interesting to see their take on replicants and, and their influence on sci-fi in general. I would say from, you know, Blade Runner when it came out, was this one in 1980, uh, in 1985, you know, to now. Um, question, do you, do you know why? And in and, and chat, if you can answer this for us. Oh, hold on a second. Oh, so, okay, let's see here. So uh, we have a answer here. The replicants in Blade Runner have a limitation of their lifespan of four years in order to keep them from rising up against their creators and to limit issues with their emotional development. Holy shit. So the movie, yeah, they have that. So the movie doesn't happen, basically. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) That is insane. And like how they actually tell the replicants or not, there's little questions, you know, that machine comes up, boom, dilates the eye, and it you know, looks at the eye and, and the way it measures the pupils and its uh, responses to certain questions that you would consider normal. Um, thank you, producer, Seth, for that. That's badass. Um, ah, yeah, that, that's crazy. Um, it almost makes me think of the movie, I think it's called Out of Time with... Uh, with Just um like- yeah exactly <laughs> where society's built up with little numbers on their skin and little <laughs> dial you know yeah. down so you can actually pay to live the longest and yeah. like yeah. get drunk in the street and get your life stolen away from you that sucks <laughs> oh yeah no definitely uh, i was thinking too um i don't know if this is related to for um philosophy but there was also a quote in the movie too about how um if you it's the creator the 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 creator of uh roy he says something to him like you know the reason why you can't live long is because you're a star and the brighter the star the half the 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 shorter the half-life is Uh so i just thought that was like an interesting thing to think about is if you you know are uh, how he's built to be you know the best that he could be um you you need to have it's important well maybe i'm maybe i'm wrong but i was interpreting it it's important to have a um to not live forever it's important to to look at life as more of a of a gift and that the more that you express yourself to others and and do the right thing and be an impact um the more that your your soul lives on beyond than just you know your physical self so the thing in the end that you were talking about like how he saves he saves um roy saves you know harris harrison ford Mm -hmm. um just to know that you know that went a longer way in like Harrison Ford's mindset of his progress and his growth of, of humanity. Cause you're saying throughout the film, he's growing mm-hmm. to be uh, less of a, a replicant mindset and more of like empathy towards, mm-hmm. towards people. So the more that, you know, you do reach out to people um, to, to save them or have, have maybe not just the film, but just in real life, like to have more of that human connection. And you're just saying like, Hey, like, I hope you're having a great day, you know, like little things like that, I feel like are way more worth, um, 
you know, you say those things because you know, life is temporary. If you just live forever and it'd be like, in my opinion, like the purge where people would just be like, I want to take everything from everybody and there's no consequences, but the real consequence in life to me is just everyone has to face death alone. And during your lifetime, you build connections because you know, in the end, you're going to be alone and you hope you have all these memories to back you up, to get you through that last stage in your life. But that's just something I took from the movie philosophical wise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Heck yeah. And, um, yeah. One thing, one thing I wanted to touch up on was, um, please do, please do. Yeah. yeah there's, there's, there's uh there's a lot of moments in this movie where, where characters uh, specifically Harrison Ford, where the, he's looking at images and um, whenever in a movie, whenever I see, you know, long scenes of characters looking at pictures or, you know, just examining films or something like I, I feel like I feel like that's like the creator, you know, just just really just really touching into what they're doing. And um, yeah, like uh, the whole thing, the whole thing is that they have like photos, like the replicants, they they all have photos and stuff, you know, they're fascinated by these photos because they, I think they, you know, they make them think that, you know, they're, they make them feel like they're closer to humanity. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Because, you know, you look at a photo and it, and it, and it can just transport you back to that feeling that you had. Um, yeah, there's that wonderful scene where yeah, he keeps zooming in, you know, looking looking for more clues. He keeps zooming in, you know. Um, another thing, another thing you mentioned, um, you know, when you when people say "have a good day" or something, there's a, there's a line that I love in this movie when uh, there's a cop and he's checking out, he's checking out, making sure Harrison Ford's not, you know, doing anything wrong. And um, before they depart, yeah, he he clears Harrison Ford. And before they depart, the cop says to him, "Have a better one." Oh you yeah. Know? Instead of saying, "Have, have a good, good one," day? yeah, yeah, he says, "Have a day. better one." Have a better one because it sucks. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, sucks every- because, <laughs> because the future sucks. <laughs> <laughs> have a good day but just have a better one that, yeah. I, I realized that too i totally forgot about yeah. that and that's that's something that's something i've said for years and just my everyday life you know i don't say have a good day anymore it's like, have a better one <laughs> i have to remember that i have to remember that's so badass that's great <laughs> uh you got both you could not be any more correct in regards to feelings and emotion uh that film screamed it in fact i'm going to shoot it back at you shortly uh but um, my three out of five is going to go up to a four out of five. Uh, main reason being is just strict, pure emotion of the film. If we replicate that today, haha, I swear, play on words, not replicants, but we actually put that here today. Um, being in retail, you guys know how it goes with guest service. We say hello at five feet. We wave at 10 feet. We're, we're constantly there. Even if people are not in the mood, that, that initial feeling of being alone or just kind of being like, kind of pause for a second. Like, oh, I'm being watched. Hi, how's it going? You know, that, that initial response in general. So people tend to feel better that way. Um, uh, you know, in the very beginning of the film, uh, whether to me, it could have been Neo Tokyo, Neo New York. Uh, it could have been, you know, Neo Boston. It could have been internationally, you know, going into thing, you know, into cities such as, um, I can't even think. The point is, is that it was very worldly and how it was portrayed. And just the fact that you went into the sci-fi shops and the billboards and the food trucks. And um, initially, you know, being introduced to Harrison Ford, uh, you can tell he doesn't want to do this. You know, and, and he's not a hero because he's a badass. He's a hero because he's very, very hesitant about the shitty world he's living in right now. And like Ethan, you mentioned before, when he killed Chris inside the streets, gunned down right there, bam, uh, you know, seeing the pain, all that situation there, he felt bad about it. And the point that he was about to die at the end, he knew it was coming for him. And he just like, I don't know what to do. And he was shocked that he's being lifted back up, you know, into that, that interaction there. Um, I just felt like he was a badass because of his resistance of wanting to believe the bullshit he was being fed, but the ability to understand that was what was going on could be a good thing, possibly, you know, uh, in that sense too as well. Um, on that note, uh, I told you guys that I raised my rating up to a four out of five for our Blade Runner 1982. Mm-hmm. Alex, I want to reflect it to you, my friend. Uh, given that your popcorn rating, um, please, uh, uh, just in, in uh, short uh, terms here, can you just explain whether the story and the directing, the casting, the acting was up to par, and if your rating is going to stay the same? 
Um, yeah, mine's a four out of five. Um, I feel like my rating's going to stay the same. And I respect um, anyone who feels like it's it's like a five out of five or, you know, a three out of five. Uh, for me, I just felt like it, it, it wasn't a five to me because uh, some of the gruesome scenes that it had, like, you know, they put the eyeballs on the shoulders and uh, also the part where he, uh, Roy, um, Ooh, crushes his yeah, skull. Yeah. And, and I respect if some people find that to be like just... Um, just I, I guess interesting I don't know but for me like I'm just not someone who like likes to watch super excessive gruesomeness mm-hmm. um, don't blame you and, yeah and I feel like I haven't watched it enough times to kind of take in like every none of that that's possible to take in everything uh because it's so layered but you know um I think sci-fi just isn't my like go-to thing to watch um but yeah, I give it. I still give it a four out of five, and I think it's the one of the most visually aesthetic things. And Ridley Scott is probably my favorite director when it comes to aesthetics. Mm-hmm. So, mm. right on, fantastic, Ethan. How about yourself, my friend? Um, yeah, it's gonna probably always stay at a five. Um, uh, I, I wish I was better prepared uh, today because uh, yeah, there's there's just so much you could talk about with this movie. Um, you, you know, you could have a whole hour discussion just just on one scene. You know, maybe. Oh uh, God, yeah. Uh, but yeah, as far as direction goes, like yeah, Ridley Scott. Uh, I I remain a fan to this day. Um, but I, I think most would agree that his best is you know Blade Runner and Alien. Um. Uh, as far as acting goes, there's that amazing scene where Harrison Ford uh, basically plays undercover and he acts like a nerd. Oh yeah, <laughs> with the girl yeah. with the snake. Yeah, with it, the girl explain with the... that one to me. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm, um, I'm, yeah, I'm it's, when he's, it's when he's when uh, he's hunting down um, what's it, Zora. It's when okay. he goes to the nightclub. Yeah, and he's holding the newspaper. And he's like, "Excuse me, Miss Salome," <laughs> and then they go into her dressing room and he's like. Uh, I'm looking for some holes, uh, you know, uh, you know, you don't know what a guy would do to see a beautiful body. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so there's a yeah, yeah Harrison Ford, um, great, but I think the MVP of the movie is clearly uh, Rutger Hauer is Roy. He's, he's like there, we wouldn't be talking about Blade Runner, I, I don't think, as much if it weren't for Roy. He's the heart of the movie. Yeah, you know, like visually he he plays for me the most like uh, a futuristic looking person yeah, because yeah. of his like white hair and his blue eyes. Get that Aryan look. That, yeah. yeah. And there was like a comment to the, the guy who makes the eyeball saying, I made your eyes. Yeah. And I just, <laughs> was like, oh. like, it just really brings it more to life to me than he's not just an actor. Like I fully believe like in the movie that he's a, he, he's a, he's different bits and parts that people put him together. Yeah. 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 I like him a lot. Yeah. And um, I think, I, I think uh, just just really quick, um, yeah. Really oh no, you're good. Make a keep going. It's okay. Yeah, he he also, um, if you've seen his films, Prometheus and Alien Covenant, I think honestly those those are more attached to the Alien franchise. I think out of a necessity to finance those movies because if you watch those movies, they're really touching on more or less uh, themes that were brought up in Blade Runner. Um, Basically, the the protagonist in that in those movies is David, the android played by Michael Fassbender, and um, it's all about creation. And like this is this is what Blade Runner, you know, is what something that it goes goes back to. So, yeah, I, I think yeah, I think you get you get like a nice trilogy out of those movies there. You know, that's Alien. awesome. Yeah. So yeah. God, yeah, I remember it took me. I was a little delayed, probably about <clears throat> thirty minutes into Prometheus, going. This looks familiar. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I will enjoy this very much so. Um, I have to agree with you guys uh, before wrapping up here in general. Uh, you know, I, I will say it's borderline five out of five for me. Uh, the main thing, whether we're talking about things such as like the casting, the directing, the storyline, uh, the visuals. Uh, you not only did Q in the, in the comments and a lot more of the audience members, both of you guys brought it up continuously. The visuals were stunning in this. If you were to tell me that I had an opportunity to sit through an hour and 30 minutes of this just to watch it visually and turn everything off, I'm down. I'd do it. I mean, because I know what to expect, you know, from the fighting scenes to the shattering glass that seems to alter reality in a sense, too. Um, yeah. 
I think the Matrix took it a lot of times into running scenes, into the darting of the of the the anti heroes going through the glass in general, um, to the fact of the rainfall calculations when he's holding Harrison Ford's hand over there and letting him know that big general general speech that that life is pain and pain is life and and that that whatever is going on it's going to go beyond them and he's finally at peace with it. And as you said before, Ethan and Alex, you brought this up earlier in, in the show. He gifted him life back. I could end this from you right now. What I'm choosing to do is save your ass. And he just puts them right there. And, and Harrison Ford, that brief five seconds of shock at his hand looking at him, that could tell an hour and 45 minute story right there and then. It, like you would be like, what the hell happened? You know? Um, you know, it's interesting though. Uh, from a couple of things here, uh, the police officer machine uh, um, called a spinner uh, in, in the film itself. Evidently, in the 1990s, MGM had a designer from Disney that collaborated and actual made a physical lifting car called the Spinner. is a generic tim uh, term for a fictional flying car used in the film. A Spinner can be driven as a ground-based vehicle and takes off vertically, hovers, and cruises much like a vertical takeoff landing called a VTOL craft, which they use within usually a lot of wartime devices. Uh, but evidently, it's used mainly the spinner uh, as a police cruiser in European countries. So evidently, that's actual physical thing. I don't know if it's actually you know current Golding, but it said they made an appearance in 1990s. Um, they, uh, Alex, you mentioned it before. It's called the Vautkampf machine. The uh, whether detect whether they're lying or not on here. There's actually two real versions of them that were made in universities and they <laughs> determine <laughs> they determine uh their answers by things called bodily functions such as the respiration blush res uh, blush response heart rate and eye movement in the capillary dilation of the soul called blush response fluctuation <laughs> That's a tongue twister there. <laughs> but evidently, yeah, it uses 20 to 30 cross-reference codes and so forth just to determine whether a person's feeling a certain reason and why. So that's kind of gnarly. So we're in the Blade Runner future is what you're telling us. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> fully. Fully, fully, fully. Well, guys, before we get close to our time here, I want both... Ethan and Alex, guys, do you have any social media that our fans, family, and friends can reach you at? Yeah, uh, you could find me on Instagram either at, at film for real at just Ethan24, or I'm on Letterboxd, uh, Real Stone Reviews. Um, check that out, all my writings there. I have a couple things written about this film here. Um, Ooh. So yeah. Yeah, and uh, the same thing, the film for real, and then uh, Ali uh, underscore Sunflower on Instagram. Right on. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, you guys can reach me at I a m c o w i e that's i am cowie uh, you can find me on instagram where i post daily shenanigans skits auditions and everyday goofy things in my life so join me on there um once again alex and ethan thank you guys for joining me into the show today discussing blade runner uh I believe here make sure i got this right 1985 um huh Oh, I apologize. I knew that. Blade Runner 1982. <laughs> Disregard the mess up on my end. <clears throat> I'm just a human, not a replicant. <laughs> but. Take that to the contest, sir. <laughs> yeah, dang it. No. Fluctuations. Bad eyes. Um, <laughs> on that note here, uh, that's all the time we have today, guys. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, be sure to join our Discord to keep the conversation going later on in the future. Shout out to the guests once again. Thank you, Alex and Ethan here. Uh, now Watch Review and Basic Binges are now in podcast form. You can listen to them on the next day on Google Podcasts, Spotify, or where you get your podcast. Please subscribe to our YouTube and Twitch. All platforms are going to be at Nontot Network. Uh, tune in to our next show tomorrow. I apologize. Um, and we are going to be discussing power rangers thank you producer steph so please guys make sure to join us thank you everybody for joining i hope you have a fantastic day and please join us next time have a good one have a better one <laughs>